be as advertised. Shall we look together at Romans chapter 12? We shall consider together verses 9 through 21. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. The Apostle Paul, practical Paul, as I am calling him for this sermon series, says this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all people. If possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will, re you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And shall we pray? Oh God, as I do each day in my private prayers, I do so publicly before our people. And I give you abundant thanks for the First Baptist Church of Ahoski. I give you abundant thanks for the privilege that is mine to serve as pastor to this congregation. Oh God, as we were reminded yesterday when we gather and laid William Leary to rest, this church has such a rich history. But we cannot live in the past. We must live in the here and now. And we must look towards and anticipate the future. We ask, O oh God, that somehow, even though we are smaller in number than we were many years ago, O oh God, may we be more pleasing to you than we have ever been before. I thank you for these people that encourage me and support me. And I thank you for these people who are patient with me when they disagree. And I am grateful for the pastor-congregation relationship that is in place. It may grow and become even stronger and richer and sweeter in the days to come. And now, oh God, we ask for the impossible. We ask that you might teach us how to live at peace with all people. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray to our God. Amen. I am struck, and I have been struck for years now, by Paul's words in verse 18. He says to the church in Rome, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Now, let that sink in for a moment. Paul says to the Romans, and he says to us today through the years, 
If possible, as far as it depends on you, <coughs> live at peace. Be at peace with all people. I was reminded just last week of how difficult this can be. Anita mentioned that we gathered at the Garrett Sykes Funeral Home Chapel last week <coughs> and we laid to rest Janice Askew Odom Mitchell. And I had, along with Anita and Vicki, we had the most unusual yet entertaining experience that I have ever had officiating a funeral and I've done many, 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 many funerals through 25 years. Janice, the deceased, 97 years old she was, Janice has a twin sister and the twin sister's name is Jane. So Janice's 97-year-old, very much still living twin sister Jane spoke at Janice's funeral. And the sisterly affection and rivalry continued even beyond the grave. Janice, Jane went on to tell that even though she is the older of the two sisters by about four minutes, Jane is the older by about four minutes, but growing up, Janice would always boss Jane around. But on this one occasion, Jane told the story. This one occasion, Jane decided to go her own way. She decided to do something without Janice. She decided to not let Janice boss her around. And so, Owen Binkley, a great big name in Southern Baptist life of yesteryear, he was the second president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, and he was here preaching a revival. This is when Oscar Creech was pastor sometime in the 1930s. And the best I can tell is that Oscar and Owen Binkley, they went around to the Sunday school rooms and I guess they presented the gospel or something. Uh, Jane says that they gave them the what for all. Whatever that means, but they gave them the what for all. And Jane says that when they came into her Sunday school, class, it felt like the preacher was speaking just to her. Her heart was stirred, and she accepted Christ, and she went forward, and she was soon after baptized. But Janice, her twin, wasn't ready to do that yet. Janice didn't want to go forward. Janice didn't want to be baptized, but Jane said, you're not bossing me around this time, girl. I'm going to do my own thing, and she did it. Now, the one thing the family asked me to do was this, Janice's family. The one specific thing they asked me to do, Pastor, you can do whatever you want to do, but we want you to read Janice's testimony. Janice had written out her testimony, and they wanted me to read it. And as Jane was telling this story, I thought to myself, uh-oh. Because what Janice says in her testimony is the complete opposite of what Jane just said. Janice says, Janice says, I heard Owen Binkley preaching and it was as if he were preaching just to me. And I got up and I walked down that aisle and I was baptized the next Sunday. Now, Jane had just said the only reason Janice was baptized with Jane is because their mother insisted that the twins do everything together. So what would you do? What would you do? I could either go on like I didn't hear what she just said, look like I wasn't paying attention, or I could acknowledge the quagmire that I was in. And so I got up. And I said, I said, 
Jane, I think you are about to have another fight with your sister beyond the grave. <laughs> and I went on to read the testimony. And I got about halfway through, and I paused. And I said to 97-year-old Jane, I said, Jane, what do you think? And she said, my sister had the wildest of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> At the graveside, the spunky, I mean spunky, healthy, 97-year-old woman said to me, she said, young man, we need to chat. <laughs> you made me look like a liar. So how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we live at peace in this life with all people as far as it depends on us? Now, the Apostle Paul admits that it's hard. Maybe he's even saying ultimately it is impossible because he says, if possible. Paul's words here, however, they seem to fall among rather random, practical directives. However, I do think I see a theme, and I'm going to try this with you today. I think what Paul is suggesting to us is that one of the best ways that we can live at peace with all people, one of the best ways that we can live at peace with as many people as possible is to live a life that is focused outward. That we live an outwardly focused life. Here again, these words from the Apostle, and they sound a bit like a pep talk. They sound a bit like he's cheering them on. He's saying to the Roman Christians, now, I've just dealt with all this lofty theology in the earlier part of my letters, and that's fine and dandy, and we can debate about that, and we can talk about that, but now I want you to get out there and do it. I want you to get out there and live the Christian life. I want you to get out there and put the, put the teachings of Jesus into practice in your life. It's a bit of a pep talk, talk here. And notice what he says in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says in verse 10, be devoted to one another. Isn't that simplistic? Isn't that easy to understand? Be devoted to one another in love. Give preference to one another in honor. That's an outward focus. We are devoted to one another within our Christian community. We are devoted to one another within our families. And we give preference to one another. Indeed, we give respect to one another in honor. Do that, and it will help us to live at peace with all people. Notice verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, practical Paul says, contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. If we are assisting folks who are less fortunate, if we are assisting folks in need of a hand up, and if we are practicing hospitality, if we are opening our doors, our church doors, our house doors, you see that is an outward focus. And Paul says, if you do this, you'll have more success in having peace in your relationships. And he goes on, verse 14. This is a good one, isn't it? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Not hard to understand very difficult to do. Alright, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We're celebrating with those who celebrate. We're crying with those who cry. And that is an outward focus, you see. 
We're blessing those who persecute us. That is an outward focus. Verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. All of these characteristics that Paul lays out for us, they lead to an outwardly focused and driven life. Would you agree with me when I say to you that strained relationships are no fun? Do you have any strained relationships in your life? Maybe the question to ask, is there anyone in this room who does not have at least one strained relationship? Strained relationships with spouses, with siblings, with co-workers, with children, with church members, strained relationships are draining. And no doubt, right, in this life, conflict is inevitable. Conflict is inevitable. It's just going to happen. We're not always going to agree. Something that strikes me as sacrosanct is not going to strike you as sacrosanct. We have differing opinions. We see through that mirror dimly in different ways. We orchestrate and construct our world in a variety of ways. And because of this, conflict is inevitable. However, I wonder, I wonder about this. Is a lot of conflict inevitable? Do we have to have a lot of conflict in our lives? Do we have to have a lot of strained relationships in our lives? Do we have to confront these strained relationships and conflict as often as we do? It seems to me, if I'm reading Paul correctly here, and he is a little random, he is a little all over the place, but if I'm reading Paul correctly here, a lot of conflict is not inevitable if we're devoted to one another. A lot of conflict is not inevitable if we are contributing to the needs of the saints and we are practicing hospitality. A lot of conflict is not inevitable. No doubt some conflict is inevitable, but a lot of conflict is not inevitable if we're rejoicing with those who rejoice, if we're celebrating with those who celebrate, and we're weeping with those who weep, and we're mourning with those who mourn. Some conflict is inevitable, but a lot of conflict doesn't have to be inevitable if we're not thinking more highly of ourselves than we are. If we're not looking down our nose at our neighbor, if we are associating with the lowly, those less fortunate than us, those in different positions in life than us, those that have not been granted the advantages in this life that we have been granted, those who have taken harder knocks in this life than we have taken. You see, if we are outwardly focused, and less inwardly focus. It makes for more peaceful relationships, I think. An outward focus makes for a more attractive person. I need to hear that. I need to hear that. A life that is outwardly focused a life that is rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. A life that is associating with the less fortunate. A life that is practicing hospitality and contributing to the needs of the saints. A life that is devoted to other human beings and giving preference to one another. If we live lives like that, we are just going to be more attractive people. More attractive people. And I think, although I don't see how you avoid all conflict, 
Conflict is a part of this life. But I think our strained relationships can be fewer. I think all of the conflict that we feel surrounded by sometimes can be lessened if we live this sort of outward life. By the way, you might be interested to know that everything worked out okay with Jane. I was nervous, right? When a 97 year old woman who's full of spunk says to you, young man, we got a chat. You made me look like a liar. I, I, I didn't quite know what was coming. And I had some butterflies. But we did the graveside service and I read scripture. I offered a concluding prayer. I sat down beside my new 97 year old friend. She said to me, she said, you know, I'm wary of ministers who don't know the deceased. And I said, Jane, yes, ma'am. It is much more difficult to officiate a memorial service for somebody you don't know. I'm, I'm with you. She said, but, and she looked me in the eyes, but you're all right. <laughs> And I said to her, I said, Jane, I don't get to hang out with many 97-year-olds. Now, there is a certain 100-year-old that I can hang out with. Right? Uh, but I don't get to hang out with many 97-year-olds. Could I have my picture made with you? And so her granddaughter took this picture of me and Jane, just precious. But I'll tell you what. <laughs> that was close. 